Loads of county finals to get through today, lads. We're going to start in Kilkenny. Um, first game on television yesterday. It was a barnstorming county final, uh, Niall. Fantastic. Bally Hill have won four in a row now. Um, it's the club's second four in a row. Um, and it is TJ Reid, Owen Reid, Colin Fennelly. It's three of them have won 10 now, which include two four in a rows. Am I right in saying that? Yeah, uh, I'm not sure if they were there for the first four in a row now, but Jesus, to win 10 county titles with your club, like it's uh, it's unbelievable stuff. I think the first of them was back in 2006, like, but uh, the lads have been there every step of the way and sure still, like TJ was still sort of lord yesterday, Owen Reid's still there and Colin Fenley as well and they probably have a few more in them as well. The great thing about this game is that pretty much you think Brian Cody was ref in this game. Just like the famous A versus B's, put your put the whistle in your pocket, let the let these boys at it. It just, I don't know, it felt like a really barnstorming match. Do you know, like I mean, it, it, it was like the clock had been turned back to ten years ago. Jeez, it was savage, wasn't it? Like it was, it was definitely no place for the for the faint-hearted out there. I know Brian Cody was up in the stands. Maybe he was in the the referee's ear or something like that because he. The referee Owen Behan was his name. He actually, I wasn't surprised to learn that he used to hurl for Kilkenny a few years ago, like because he was a lad that sort of uh, he enjoyed the uh, hard hits that were going in yesterday because he trundled the ball in, he blew his whistle, and he seemed to swallow it after that because even the very first ball, I think it was uh, Owen Reid got the ball up along the sideline and he was sent right into the wire out towards the stand and the ref like just play away boys, play away, and that's the way it was for the the whole day, like and. Do you know, it was it was it was great to watch, really, wasn't it? Like it added to the spectacle. I did, of the game. It did, and no players complaining that they're not getting their frees. Like it's just understood in Kilkenny Hurlan. I was laughing that Owen Behan is from Fenians, JJ Delaney's club, and I remember very very well on the Monday after the All Ireland final in two thousand and nineteen, I had to pull JJ up on because everybody, the majority of pundits, Lee agreed that Richie Hogan was very unlucky, but it was a red card. The only pundits that were not in agreement with this were Kilkenny pundits. And I says to JJ, JJ, can you not see that you're being biased here? That it's only Kilkenny trying to say it's not. He says, Wooly, that's not the way the game's refed in Kilkenny hurling. And I think after seeing yesterday's county final, I kind of I I, I definitely appreciate where JJ is coming from. That wouldn't even the game wouldn't even be stopped for that in, <laughs> in Kilkenny Club Hurling. Yeah, they're just made differently in Kilkenny, aren't they? Um bred differently and tougher men and that's just the way that they are. Uh, in fairness to them, it must be really difficult then to go to the county scene and they're blowing up fouls left, right yeah. and centre for things you wouldn't even consider to be a foul. It must be a hard adjustment to make, but I reckon that when they go back to club football, they can just go hell for leather and really enjoy it. Yeah. Club well, Berlin. Yeah, well, I was going to, just about <laughs> to pull you up on that there, Lee. <laughs> but I thought, I thought Niall, he took it a bit too far to Paddy Deegan time when he was through and he got, he got hit in the face. His nose was bleeding. Like, this wasn't even blown up as a free. Now, Paddy threw his hands up a bit theatrically, which probably turned the referee off giving it to him. And I thought it th- I thought in real time, I was like, ah, Paddy, you're making the most of that. But then you see it, geez, he, he got a hurl right to the face. Yeah, like it was a smack kind of right across the face. The ball was, there was maybe shades of the ball that he got. Um, I think it was Kevin Mullen and he kind of half got the ball, but geez, he followed through then kind of onto Paddy Deegan's face guard. And uh, it would have been a free in, in most counties, I'd say, but... Uh, no, Owen Behan just didn't want to know about freeze yesterday. There was one oh. stage, I think it was the 47th minute, there was a puck out came out from the O'Loughlin Gales goalie and it landed down and Adrian Mullen, he shouldered into a lad, he got the ball, he got hammered by another lad, stayed going. Hugh Lawler eventually got onto the ball and he was nearly upended as well and there, was, there could have been about three or four freeze in the one passage of play but your man didn't even blow the whistle, whist, whistle once. Like He was just... He was delighted with the way the the thing was panning out and it, it, it did add to the sort of spectacle of the whole thing because at the end of that passage of play then the ball broke out to Brian Cody and it was like a it was a brilliant sort of passage of play and you know one of these scores that comes after there's been hits and yeah, yeah. both teams are there thereabouts and it was a real kind of a momentum changer I suppose in the game at that stage and like if he had blown for the free we wouldn't have seen such a great score you know so um, it definitely added to it It definitely did the big turning point of the game obviously a lot of games were heroic like, I mean, they were, and it's just almost like you'd see Waterford playing Limerick and they're heroic, but they're just too good, you know, and the Bally Hill just wore them down and they were brilliant in the last quarter, but the Lachlan Gales were three up and they tried a bit of a fancy kind of Gaelic football hand pass move. I think it was uh, Paddy Deegan who, Jesus, we'll talk about him in a second, he gave a hand pass. Like, the point was on, I suppose, and the last hand pass didn't really send 
the I think it was centre forward straight through and goals. It was a, it, probably in hindsight it was over elaboration. Ballyhale right from that uh, mistake that probably should have gone four up. Ballyhale come down score a goal, and then within a minute of two goals done, game over. I know it's mad the way that it just changed on that, like because it was such a brilliant move and O'Loughlin's were hurling so well at that stage that they. Like they, that was the reason they had the confidence to nearly try this move. Like it was sort of intricate hand passing. They were and playing just, so well, yeah. They were playing so well at that stage, and I was like Andy Comerford said before the game. He said like, "These there's a lot of young lads in the O'Loughlin's team, and they've beaten them in under twenty one finals." He said, "We're not afraid of Bally Hale," and you could see that in them, like, yeah, because they horsed into them from the from the word go, like. But as soon as that kind of that move broke down. Like Bally Hale had two goals within two minutes and they were only three points up but it was such a momentum shift that you nearly knew the game was over, didn't you? I was it, yeah. When they went three up because, like I mean, at that stage all Auckland girls were finding a little bit harder to score. What about Paddy Deegan? Because right? this is the first game we've seen a full... Like, I mean, I, I'm a little bit obsessed with Paddy Deegan. He's a banker to start 14 for Kilkenny. Like, I can't believe how naturally he looks up there. If you were to watch that game having never heard of Paddy Deegan before and you were looking at that match you think he's a full forward, wouldn't you? He looked like a full forward. He did key, the Keen Lynch flick up off the ground. He knows when to throw it off. He knows when to go for his own score. He doesn't look like a defender playing at full forward, does he? Not at all. Like I'd say that must be the reason Colin Fenley's after retiring this morning. <laughs> yeah. like he's seen, seen the writing on the wall here of Paddy Deegan. But like he was, he was flicking balls into his hand. I think twice he got points where he just took, and it's something TJ Reid does very often, takes a quick sideline and is able to get it back and straight over the bar. Like I don't think he even had a, maybe he had one wide yesterday. But to score 2-4 and like Mark and Joey Holden, Joey Holden didn't even have t- like a, a bad game. Like it was just Paddy Deegan was sort of, he was like a man inspired out there yesterday. And like if O'Loughlin Gales were to have won, like geez, it would have gone down as the, the Paddy Deegan County final. But it shows how good Ballyhale are that I- even with Paddy Deegan and with most of the O'Loughlin Gales team playing so well, they were still able to beat them. Still able to beat them. Number 13 was very good for O'Loughlin Gales. I don't want to put you on the spot. The chap with his tattoos. Was, own yeah. wall, yeah. Jeez, brilliant goal he got, wasn't it? It was a brilliant goal. And a great, a great point in the second half where he had to throw it back on the hurl. Mm. He barely got it over the bar. I wouldn't say he's much of a right-hand side. Yeah, but he was just, he was so tricky and jinky and every every time he was on the ball, he was kind of darting one way and going the other and like he just had, had Bally Hale in a lot of trouble like, but um, yeah, geez, that's the, the brilliance of Bally Hale. Like it wasn't even, wasn't really Colin Fenley or Owen Cody stepping up. It was lads that we hadn't known really, like say Joseph Cudahy got 1-1, one, one, Brian Butler and then Ronan Corcoran, the man of the match. Like, so how do you beat them? Yeah, no, he was brilliant in midfield. Brian Cody was in the crowd, uh, Lee, and he had the mask off, which I thought, I couldn't believe my eyes. I was saying that we can declare the, the pandemic completely over now. Brian Cody has discarded the mask. Yeah, it's unusual to see. It's sort of become part of his identity now. Like, I mean, <laughs> hard exactly. to even recognise him without it. <laughs> and just the, the Kilkenny badge and everything on it, it's 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 iconic. You could probably sell that on eBay for a brief bit, but uh, it's gone now, so we're all in the clear. Yeah, we're all in the clear. He's outdoors, I suppose, so, so it's not too bad. You you mentioned Colin Fenley got sent off uh, or got or retired after the match, and I suppose on the performance, you're looking at Paddy Deegan, you're looking at Colin Fenley. I think the full forward line for Bally Hale only got a point. Um, Colin Fenley probably wasn't at his best. Maybe when you're 32, you take a year out. You know, it's not that same intensity. It's not that same training. You're more relaxed in your life. Might have been harder. For, it might be hard for him to come back at 33 next year. You know, and get back into the swing of things. But he's put. He's he's done anyway. And he probably has three or four more years with Belly Hale anyways. Yeah, like he's still in brilliant shape. Like as you as you seen from the, I think it was the very first ball that went into him. Like he just bore down on goal. Um, he didn't finish it off. Like, but the fullback was brilliant. He did his measure. The cornerback did well as well coming across that time. But yeah, the fullback had a good game too. And it was just, I suppose, yeah, like maybe having taken the year out last year, it kind of gave him, I suppose that gave him the idea whether he wanted to come back. Like he'd have known after the year, do I want to come back or do I want to stay doing what I'm doing? And sure, he's happy enough with Bally Hale. He, he gets enough hurling there anyway, do you know? Yeah, exactly. St. Junan's won in Donegal, uh, Lee. Um, first title in seven years which is a good while for Unions has put them up level with Guidor now at the top of the table um, for county titles it's hard we'll talk about Unions in a minute because like I mean they were good, very good in the second half it's hard to think of a worse display from a team going for three in a row than Nave Connell in, I, I would say in the history of of Gaelic football they scored two points from play one was a late one these are going for three in a row I have to keep reminding everybody they were absolutely just deplorably flat. And then to cap it all off, had two players sent off 
I would say the first one, uh, Eunan Doherty was probably harsh. Um, I think he went to give the ball a good aggressive fist and the Union's player started holding his neck. I don't think he got <coughs> get, hit him in the neck. And then Charles McGuinness was just an absolutely horrific sending off on live television. You don't often see that. You see that in a junior B match. You know, like a, you know, for a club going for three in a row and what a strong favourites, they, they didn't end the day in a, in a good light at all, did they? No, they really let themselves die and it was uh, a disappointing affair even from like a neutral's point of view and, and just trying to and hoping for an entertaining match. We didn't even really get that. But from Neve Connell, I mean, it looks so lackluster. Um, yeah. When your whole performance is based around, you know, negating play and nullifying the opposition and, and then catching them on the counter and you go down pretty early in the game and you're sort of chasing the game, it's, they, they, they obviously look like they'd run out of ideas. Uh, that's ending off at the end with Charles McGuinness. I mean, I don't know what was wrong with him. Uh, he completely threw the head up, threw an elbow, could send off for it. And then when the red card was already banished, he went after one other player, put his hands around his throat and was doing the whole macho man thing, like, come on, egging people on and everything. And yeah. it just looked really, really bad. He, he let the club down massively there. I think I think he did. I was complaining about this game um, during it. And it's not a big deal. Like, we, we, we flagged this on Thursday. This is not going to be a good game. We know how Nave Connell set up. They're, they're very good. But I think this is a problem in Donegal football in general because... Like Nave Connell aren't extremely, extremely defensive. They are very defensive, but they push up on kickouts. You know, we've seen worse years ago and we've seen better games. I think it's a whole mentality in Donegal football that you are completely risk averse. You refuse to bring it into any contact. The minute you see somebody going to tackle you, you kick it backwards. You know, to somebody that's completely free. The person that collects the ball isn't running at pace. He just collects it and he could just run across the side of the field and they'll go the whole way across the other side of the field and they'll start attacking from over there. And they haven't done it at any real pace because the Dave Connell team can just move across or the, the Unions team can just move across. And it's like you, you're, you've been on one side, you've been stopped. You've slowly moved it to the other side. You're facing the exact same thing on the other side. And like, you know, it's not like you've been clever and moved it fast across the field. I, I just don't get it. Like, I mean, they don't attack at pace, neither team. Until towards the end, Unions, you know, played very well and caught them on the counter. But, you, you know, the uh, Nave Connell didn't have everybody. They, they passed the ball backwards all over the field. No matter where it is on the field, they're happy to kick it backwards, pass it backwards. The man that receives the ball is just in a static standing position and they refuse to take any risks. And like I saw a tweet from Eamon McGee on this. And like we see teams, lots of teams get 13 men back behind the ball. But when you're so risk averse and you refuse to go in and engage or try to get through them, it just turns into a terribly boring game. I'm not uh, blaming teams for getting 13. Often the very top teams end up with 13 behind the ball. But it doesn't look like a poxy game like like you see up in Donegal. And it probably the attitude is summed up. Uh, I read a tweet from Eamon McGee, obviously playing with uh, Guido. And they weren't bad to watch uh, when they won it. But they were probably doing a lot of backwards passing as well. I think this is just in their mentality, how they see dealing with this is never ever to take a chance um, he says on the Donegal final do we have to have this debate again two well coached teams trying to work out the puzzle just a different way of playing the game and that's a different way of playing the game and that's unique to Donegal as far as I'm concerned they take the whole not taking risk to whole new levels and that's why their club football stinks the place out it's impossible to watch and nobody's necessarily criticising the fact that teams play defensively. It's the teams that refuse to break down the defensive team is probably what, I, you know, the defensive situation. No excitement in the game. Just a terribly dull, horrible advertisement for Gaelic football. And you know, Eamon obviously more than happy just to be watch two teams work, work out the puzzle. Yeah, I mean, the, the two words you said there, risk adverse, that, that's exactly it. And it comes down to the coaching. Um, there's, I've been, you know, at coaching sessions where the manager holds up the ball and he, he says, this is the most important thing on the pitch. You know, we yeah. when we have it, you have to keep it. And all of that makes complete sense. Of course it does. But when it's just drilled into you and when you're a crucified, I mean, crucified for making mistakes by like attempting to go forward or attempting that kick pass and switching the play a little bit quicker. When you're crucified for things like that, then it's just drilled in. You get it through the hands, we'll yeah. go up and down and there's constantly someone on the sideline shouting the word patient patience 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 <laughs> trying to not rush things and it's just like you know what sort of a game of football that you're going to be in for um see about about five six years ago uh 
when that was the norm. Uh, it was already hard to watch then. Like no one was really enjoying watching that. But at least it was the norm at the very top level of like the county scene to the very bottom of club football league. Like, that's just what was done. Yeah. But now after such a, an exciting, uh, you know, county season, and we just spent the summer watching lots of uh, high scoring games, lots of great kick passing and forward attacking and really entertaining stuff and then you're looking to get your fix of football and you watch this club match and it's like that and you're sent back it's just such a damn squid it's just now it's even harder to watch and it's harder to stomach and it's not yeah i mean i don't know if it's a, a donegal thing well it clearly is a donegal thing because both teams are doing it um something similar sort of happened in Derry. i know we're going to talk about it later on but uh glenn at least they were the team that came and brought the attack and and they broke through for it in the end um but yeah, it's, it's it's a culture change that, that needs to happen. Yeah, no, it, it definitely is. And unions weren't too much better at it. They just got scores, like, like I mean, in the second half. You don't get scores until you want to take, unless you take a risk. Football has to be about risking, you know, going at it, going with a fella off your shoulder and breaking through that line and going at it with pitch. Look at O'Sheen Mullen, look at the way Mayo break down these systems. It's just very, very unusual to go back and see such static, slow, sideways. And they're proud of this. It's like you're being they're trying to be too clever. I don't know. I just like uh, from a hurling person's point of view, Niall, for, uh, and uh, like I'm I'm a football man, but it's very hard to watch that Ballyhale of Lachlan's game and be on a bit of a high after, and then sit down and watch that. And it was just deplorable stuff to watch. Yeah, I seen someone tweet this morning that it was like watching Miss, Mrs. Brown's boys after watching Faulty Towers. Like it was just like the Kilkenny hurling game was the complete opposite of watching the the Donegal club football because Kenny Hurling was kind of hard hitting to his boys bursting forward and then the Donegal football it was just as you said static kind of passing across the screen and the way Eamon McGee is going on about it there it's kind of as if like this this defensive system well he it, it, it's as if it's something to be proud of like but it's nearly a cop out just to call that a defensive like that that is defensive football because as we've seen during the summer teams can play defensive football yeah. and they can still be entertaining and they can still take risks like you know it's the but attacking team I have the problem with both attacking teams they, they just refuse to break it down mm. you know they refuse to engage they refuse to attack at pace it, it's very very hard to watch I suppose Niall O'Donnell and his brother Shane were, were outstanding for, for Unions I don't want to be too hard on Unions like I mean they, they, they were the, the only team that probably did play that bit of football in it and like I mean Rory Kavanagh's first year managing at senior level I don't want to be too critical of him because that's just the culture up there that's how they see the right way to break this down is and that's why their games are like 9 all, 8 all. It's not because of the defensive team. It's because how they choose to attack against the de- defensive team. That seems to be the culture up there. And, you know, Eamon can probably, you know, it's a, you have to work out the puzzle, you know, rather than blowing the puzzle away, you know, that kind of way. Because it, it has been well figured out. That puzzle has been well figured out like five years ago, hasn't it, Lee? Like, I mean, it's no secret, you know, you just don't take the ball into contact without a bit of support. And what's more, the big important thing is, is if that ball is broken down, you work like a dog as hard as any team to get that ball. You can actually turn the defensive team, their tactics against them, that if it breaks down, if they break you down inside their 45, you have enough men pushed up, you can actually pin them back inside their 45 and win it back off them. You know what I mean? You shouldn't, you don't need to be scared of these teams doing this anymore. No, that's it. And like pace is a big thing with you know, going up against it as well, because... But like before, when it first sort of came into play and no one knew how to handle it, uh, you'd have the ball, you'd look ahead of you, you'd see three, four men and you go, well, I'll give it a go. And then you just ran clearly into traffic. But you've ran from like a static position on the ball. Now it's the runners off the shoulders who break the line. That's how you get through these sort of things, these yeah. sort of tackles. Um, and you build your whole play about that. Yeah, hold on to the ball because you can and then wait for that runner who's going to time it and make, break that tackle. And if they get through two or three then another runner has to come through straight off after it and that's exciting you know that's forward thinking football and trying it and there's a, that, that's a tactical setup you know that's two teams that's a puzzle and you figured the puzzle out you know that that is the answer so i don't really know what that means when both teams both teams are just playing the same way and it's it's not it's just not very entertaining in the end yeah. um so the unions did have better flashes of like creativity and stuff like even the goal itself it came the lovely it turned finish, over yeah. a, a goal kick yeah and the like it fell to the halfback, he had his head up, you know, and he just floated the ball in beautifully and it was finished. Like, I was a real, you know, like flash of brilliance and, and a, a lovely kick pass in. 
Um, so they were the, the braver team on the day and they're the one with the trophy. Yeah, exactly. And they got an awful lot of joy off the off the Nave Connell kick out. That's probably where they got most of the joy. And that's obviously where Nave Connell are that little bit out of uh, their defensive uh, setup. And unions have all their forwards kind of in, in position. So that's kind of, you know, the story of that game. In Nace or in Kildare, Nace are Kildare champions. They beat Sarsfields by 14 points to 12. They led the whole way through. They were 8-1 up. Um, at one stage, it was their first county title since 1990 and a man playing with them since 1999. Their captain, Eamon Callaghan, joins us on the line now. Eamon, you're a happy man today. Yeah, uh, delighted to be honest. Um, still hasn't quite sunk in yet, but um, yeah, I woke up this morning with a big smile on my face anyway. You said um, after the game yesterday, I never thought uh, today would come. Yeah, um, yeah, I suppose like I've been at it a long time now uh, with with the club and the county and... Um, I've been, yeah, it's like playing for a long time and just never really getting over the line with Kildare and with the club we were never really kind of um, at that level where we were competing for for championships and um, I kind of always wondered like geez I'm going, I'm going to go my whole career here without winning anything uh, substantial so I kind of did think for a long time that maybe it wasn't going to happen but um, yeah look at we, we, we've we had a very good year and uh, yesterday just was uh, just the icing on the cake really So what changed this year like I mean you know you're, you're sticking around well you're still playing well you're 39 on Friday uh, you're looking fairly fresh yeah. still uh, to be fair like I mean you saw this good team coming along and, and the potential obviously Yeah I, I, I was lucky enough to be involved with them um, at minor level I was co- did a bit of coaching um, for the for um for three years with, with the minor teams and the under twenty one teams and uh, we won our, our first minor championship that year uh, for the first time in pretty much the same I think in thirty odd years or twenty odd years and um they won I think three minors out in four years there so I kind of knew something was coming with these younger lads um they were excellent you know and they just there was a good group of them uh, coming through so um they'd also won like a fail all Ireland, you know, back back when they were playing Fela. So um they've stuck at it obviously throughout the years and when when they developed into senior players then I just knew that uh, we wouldn't be too far off if we could keep them all together. Right. Okay. And one of the one of those young lads, Derek Irwin, he was flying it in the first half. You went you went eight points to one up. Like you had a fairy tale start. Yeah, and I don't I geez, I never in in all my um expectations or kind of seeing how well the game would go I never thought we'd get that much of a, a start like you know 8-1 was, it was kind of surreal like after 22 minutes I think we were 8-1 up um, and we, we kind of came out of the chops fairly quick and uh, yeah but like obviously Sarsfields are always going to come back at you they're very, fairly experienced uh, themselves and they've been here a lot like you know they've been here for years um, they kind of came back at us at the end of the first half um and that you know, I think we went in half time three points up. But uh, I think we kind of steady. We we were steady enough in the, at the start of the second half, and we kind of kept our lead. But then, um, the last fifteen minutes then was a different story. We was kind of just pure chaos. But uh, well, that was it. Luckily, so we were able to hang on. You you kept the lead. You were six points up. Of course, we I'm only reading match reports. So I'll wait to see. T G Cahar will have some highlights tonight because like we had to sit through the Donegal County final, which was no crack at all. And like I mean, you know, there there looked like. You know, it, like it was a very exciting game in that you built up a big lead. After 47 minutes, you still had this, a six-point lead, which, you know, fairly solid. And then they scored five in a row to leave you only a point up and squeaky bum time. Oh, stop. Yeah, it was, it was, it was, oh, it was brutal now, to be honest. Ten minutes, <laughs> we just could, could not get our hands on the ball. Like, um, whatever happened, and like for kick out, they won every break, you know, and it, oh, it was just... Pure chaos. We see, we, we had a black card uh, with ten minutes to go. With, well, with about twelve minutes to go, I think we got a black card, and I think a minute later, or at the same time, Owen Doyle was off injured. Um, so that was a double kind of blow for us yeah. in, in that for for the last ten minutes, and um, we were just kind of chasing our tails. Really, we were just trying to get our hands on the ball. We couldn't do it. Every like Sarsfield just came at us in waves, and get the extra man, and um. Yeah, I think like they just kind of they just had to let the shackles off at that stage and just attack us, and they did. Fair enough. Did you think and, it was um, did, did you think it was slipping away? Like I mean, you know, you haven't won it in so long, and they're you know the more experienced team. They're coming back. Probably a neutral would think Sarsfields are probably going to win it at that stage. Oh yeah, and uh, that was definitely on, on the field. I was trying to, well, like, I was just kind of trying to get the message across that just to get on the ball, just to, to get if we could get ourselves on the ball, and just even just break the momentum a bit or you know run take a minute or two off the clock but they were just coming at us and at us and um 
yeah, like, I, like when they got back to one point, I was thinking, oh, here we go now. This is this is going to end well now. But um, yeah, because there was still a couple of minutes to go. I think there was still maybe including injury time, maybe three or four minutes. And but, well, like a one point lead was nothing at that stage. They're after kicking five in a row, and um, yeah, just thankfully we just got our hands on that, on, on one ball and um, got off the pitch, and I think we got a free or something, and we kind of just kept possession for a bit and um. Ended up just uh, getting a fisted score at the end to kind of make it a two-point game. It was time up then. Yeah, it was Paul McDermott got the fisted point. Probably one of the only occasions in a match that you'd actually champion a fisted point. I'm allergic to them, but this was the right deci- the right decision to make at that stage of the game. Yeah, well, you, you won't take the highlights, I think, because I think we got four <laughs> fisted points. I think, we, I think we scored four yesterday, uh, which I was like, we were only talking about last night. You, like, you never see, you, you rarely see them. Well, not that you rarely see them, but yeah, to get four in one game was... Uh, or something else, but yeah, he took the right option anyway because um, off oh, he if, if if the keeper had saved a goal chance or something, yeah. then he, he could have played on another play. So we were all roaring at him to fist it over the bar. Yeah, I hope none of those fisted points were from Derek Herwin now because I'm a bit of a fan of Derek Herwin's and I would be let oh, down. And he likes yeah, to kick points. Yeah, just don't watch the highlights. <laughs> <laughs> so come here, listen. We could we maybe put all these fisted points down to their new management team, yourself and Owen. Like I mean, this is. This <laughs> How, how how have you taken to this? Like, I mean, this has just landed on you. Yeah, it was, uh, it was just it was just mad there for a couple of weeks. But um, yeah, like I wasn't really to be fair to now, it wasn't really a joint management team at all. It was really on dial. Like he he took charge. Um, look, at I helped him out obviously, and a couple of the players, senior lads, did. But uh, I um, he he really took the reins now, and we just decided that um, with the timeline, we only had a week. Yeah. You know, a week to go before the semi final. So there's only like two training sessions um to take. So we said we'd we kind of read like instead of getting a, a manager in um you know, to take over that we kind of we, we kind of be able to run it ourselves for that week and just try and get over the line, try and get over the semi final and then um, once we did that then obviously it was just a two week gap then to the final. So we we kinda of felt that we were in a good place. Like we didn't have to change anything. We we, we keep we kept training, you know, it was the same as we, we've trained all year, um, same preparations. Uh, so we kind of just felt it was best to um, keep it kind of within the players to kind of organise things ourselves and um, and just do it that way. I think we had the right personnel in us in, in the squad to to deal with that as well, like which was a massive thing. Like uh, we the young lads, um, you know, that we talked about are not your your ordinary young lads. You know, they're fairly driven and fairly well motivated and. Uh, we had a couple of experienced lads then as well to, to help out. Well, that was it. We were saying on the show when we heard that news that, you know, the hard work is done, you know, the game plan is kind of settled on and it's a matter of continuing on. Well, like, was this left to you as a squad to sit down yourselves and decide, did you want the new manager or did you, you know, want to do it yourselves? This was your decision. Yeah, it was, yeah. Like, well, a couple of a couple of players met up, like, a couple of the kind of senior lads met up when um, that weekend and we just had a talk about it and see, we... we, we we had a, we were open up to any options really. We kind of talked about a lot of things about bringing managers in, or we had a lot of names, kind of um, ideas that we could do. But uh, we met for like an hour or two maybe, and we just after that we we went back and thought about it, and we just came back then after saying um, that we should lead it. But the players and Owen was happy to to lead it, right. um, and and he did like and he he did lead it like you know he he organised everything. He did a lot of work behind the scenes. Um, you know, just organ- just the general stuff for organising training sessions, drills, doing video analysis and doing all this kind of, he kind of took the reins for that, like, so, um, no, it, it worked out very well, like, Owen is a, he's a special kind of a character, um, and, you know, he has huge respect amongst the players, so, like, it was fairly, um, it, you know, it, it worked out very well for us. It was, it was a, it was a tough decision, but I, I thought it was the right one. Yeah, definitely. And Camir, like, would Owen have been making a few changes mid-game or bringing on subs? Was was that his responsibility as well, or was that given to a selector? Yeah, so we we, we had kind of four club four local lads in the, that we we knew from the club um, that Owen Owen brought in and um, to help out just on match day and and in, in training sessions as well. So when we like Owen would probably plan out a training session. Um, but the, we had four lads who um, who kind of ran the, ran the session while we trained. Um, just we just felt it, impo- it was important that we we needed to concentrate on our own training as well. Like like yeah. Owen had to prepare, I had to prepare as normal as, as we always would. But we was um, that the lads would kind of take the session, uh, and the same on match day. Then like they once match day came, they took the reins of it. They they organised subs. Um, any kind of switches or changes had to be made. They did it. Uh, on the line so okay. um, Owen would have had them prepped for that like 
Right. And come here, like, so I'm, I wasn't really thinking he had to bring in four new lads because Paul Kelly obviously left, so his whole management team would have left then as well. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah, they did. And, like, in fairness, like, see, we, like, we had um, Fergal Costello was training us. Um, like, he's, he's, he's uh, obviously a Mayo, but he, he's moved up to Nace and he's been in a Nace for the last uh, geez, 15 years. So he's been around the club, um, Fergal. So he's, he was coaching us this year, but he went away with the army then um, a couple of months ago. Right. So he was gone. So he, he was really the only um, nice, um, kind of nice man in the backroom team. Um, so when, when Paul Kelly left, then obviously like the whole the, the management team left. So we were kind of left with nobody. Uh, so we like we had to start from scratch basically, and that's 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 why we um, you know, we decided to keep it kind of player led and keep it kind of in house. Yeah, Jesus, it's a great story. Like what happened with Paul Kelly? Can you tell me that now that you have won it, or 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 what the hell? Because you hear a whole load of 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 rumors about what went on. Like I mean, was, okay, I'll, I'll ask you this: What was it a problem with the players, or was it a problem with the you know club administration or club you know management? Yeah, so like I, like, I don't really want to talk about it to be honest. Right. Um, maybe for another day, and maybe for someone else to talk about it. But um, look at it, he, he 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 stepped away. Um, I'm sure there's there's a issues going on with uh, with stuff in the background I don't know we like what happened happened um, we didn't have time to um, we didn't have time you know it wasn't like in the middle of the season or in the middle of a league campaign where we could have uh, things could have been sorted out or yeah. we could have gone got a new manager and got in and that was the problem like there was no blueprint uh, for us to go off like this had never happened like it was, we couldn't pick up the phone to anyone and say oh like when this happens to you what, what do we do <laughs> uh, we kind of had to wing it like and it was it obviously had never happened before and I think just the timing of it uh, just made it more kind of difficult for us um, in that it was like a week a week before the uh, a semi-final you know and that was that, that was the kind of biggest uh, hurdle we had to get over um, mm. he must have yeah no, so it wasn't it, it wasn't ideal he must have had no other choice to leave at such a time yeah, like uh, to, to, with, with the time frame. Yeah, with like the week before yeah. a semi final. Like, I'm, this, you know, I'm just trying to get my head around what could have happened that would have made this, you know, th- for him to have left, you know. Like, I mean, I, I, so if, if he had a problem with the administrators in the club or a problem with the actual club itself, you would have thought still his kind of loyalty to you would have overridden that for another few weeks. Yeah, and look, I, I don't know. Like, and that, that, those, those conversations might have happened. Um, behind the scenes you know I, uh, to be honest we, we were just kind of uh, we were just kind of told what, what, what happened that uh, that weekend really we got word and it was um, look at it, it's, it's, it's a conversation for, for another day really yeah. uh, there's there's you know there's been plenty of rumours going out around there and plenty of talk going around but um, look at it it's, 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 it wasn't really anything uh, that the players um, that you know the, the, that would kind of concern the players, really, you know, in in the build up to a, a big semi final, you know, and that that was the kind of uh, that was the kind of uh, problem we had. Right, right. Any contact with him since the final? Um, ah, yeah, like like Paul has as as text uh, wishing us the best, wishing uh, us the best of luck, and um, yeah, I've, I've, I've texted him, um, I texted him there in the last week, so um, yeah, we've we've had a bit of contact, yeah. Right. Okay. She's a very interesting story. We'll get to the bottom of it. So we'll get to the bottom. I tell you, you run a tight ship in this because we can't. All we're getting out of there is rumors. So I think that's the Kira Magini effect. Keep it in house, and maybe 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 used it as a siege mentality, which you would have been used yeah. to under Geezer. I know. Yeah. Yeah. No, we love another siege mentality. But uh, yeah, no, it wasn't even the case. Like, you know, in terms of the players, it, we it was always about the players, you know, and like. Even managers will tell you that, like that they they'll do a certain amount, but it's it's all up to the players, really. Like you know, who, if they're the ones who have to sacrifice so much and put in the effort, and on the day of a match, they're the ones who have to deliver. And uh, we we've spoken about that a lot over the over the last couple of years, but um, especially in the last four weeks, that um, like no matter who's in charge of us or who's running running the ship, that it, it's still down to the players, and we kind of focused on that for the last four weeks, especially. Um, it wasn't like a siege mentality or anything, but we just we. We really just had to kind of focus on the things we were doing all year and to try and just keep the performance levels high because we had been playing very well all year, um, and we just had to continue that for another for you know for the four weeks. Yeah, Come here, there were some great scenes at the full time whistle. Like, I mean, you seem to be fairly well supported for a town team. Would that be fair to say? Um, yeah, yeah. There was a huge, there was a huge nice crowd there yesterday. Um, like, obviously, nice is a big town, and there's a, there's a huge population there, and. Uh, 
you know, I think with the juvenile commi- juvenile section is massive in ace, and there's a lot of kind of parents getting involved and a lot of underage lads. Um, there was a huge amount of kids at the game yesterday, but uh, that was great to see. Um, it was, yeah, like the, we, we've never had that. I, I've never experienced that in the town. Um, yeah. Like flags, flags up around the town and just everyone wishing the best of luck during the week and getting messages from everyone. Um, that's the first time I've ever experienced that with Nace. So uh, that was that was great to see, you know, because we're always kind of compared to Newbridge, um, you know, five ten minutes across the way there, and they've they've two of the most successful clubs in the county, um, over the years, and you know, we, we I, I think um, that conversation has always been how has uh, how have Nace not you know been yeah. dominating, but uh, I think look, I, I I think I think we have the things in place there now. Uh, where we can start kind of competing at a at a, at a more consistent level, and uh, that's all you can do really. Like you can just make sure if you're if you're competing there thereabouts, um, you know, like that's that's all you'd be looking for. I I, I definitely relate to a big town and the support. Uh, Port Leash are notoriously have poor support um, for county finals and stuff. Like a little village would have a bigger cheer than we would running out in the field. Yeah. And then you come back into the town with the cup and like a lot of people wouldn't even know there was a match on, which is just, it's a weird uh, situation. Yeah. But it, just on that, because I, like you won your last title in 1990. And before that, that 1990 uh, title ended a 58-year wait. So like, I mean, Nace has been really, really badly underachieving. But you, you, you think, you know, you've turned that corner now because like it probably isn't good enough for a big town like Nace. I know there's a lot of competition in the big towns, probably rugby in Nace, but like I mean, at the same time, you, you, like with one team in the in the in the town, you know that needs to be changed, I suppose. Yeah, and that's that's something that you know I think in in, in Ubers they have you know they have that rivalry between Morfin and Sarsfield. And yeah, that kind of motivation for lads to play and to stay around and stick at it, and um, we don't like we do have a lot of. There are a lot of distractions, and you might know in a, in a big town like in Port Leash and Nace as well. Like there are a lot of distractions other than football. Um, not even like there's obviously a couple of sports that are being played, but even distractions down the town and different things going on. So, uh, like that, that's I I don't know, and I, I don't know, I, I don't understand how we haven't been competing. But m- m- my father always says like uh, he calls the 1990 team the great one in a row team. <laughs> um, so like that's um. That's what we're kind of hoping to avoid, you know, that we don't just uh, leave this with one, like a one-hit wonder and, uh, you know, fall back into the trap. But um, like I was saying yesterday, like we've uh, a hell of a long way to go before we're like, categorised in the same in, in the same uh, category as Morfield or Sarsfield. You know, we've there consistently have been there for the last 15 years. Yeah. And that's what we're all kind of looking to, to achieve, like just to, you know, it's it's not just about winning one. Like, you know, we, we, we really do need to kind of hammer home now the next five or ten years and, and hopefully we can we can do that to be competing at that level well listen with the management team you have in place there there's the sky's the limit it could be a three in a row uh, with uh, Owen Doyle <laughs> an up and coming an up and coming manager yeah. the, the sky's the limit oh, come here yeah. Abel I'll let you go and let you get uh, go and enjoy the celebrations thanks very much for taking the call congratulations no problem at all. Thanks very much. Yeah, great stuff from Eamon there. I'm delighted for Eamon who, you know, stuck around long enough to win his county title. It's interesting, Lee, where you, where you hear him saying there, like he'd never won anything, neither with Kildare nor with, he would probably have been beaten in a couple of Leinster finals and never won anything with Nace. Imagine going through your whole career. Sometimes I think without going on about what I've won, I don't know to take them for granted when you're at a big club like Portlaoise. You know, I've won six and like, I mean, you know, grand. And won some stuff with Leash as well. And then you think, imagine going through your whole career without having ever won, won, won anything like Eamon. You know, for an inter-county player like Eamon, it, it was just unusual to hear it. Mm-hmm. And for a player who's like so clearly deserving to win something and clearly of an ability and a level, you know, where he could be in teams that are winning things. But um, no, I mean, it's credit to him and it's credit to his longevity as well. You know, he's obviously kept that fire burning and that hunger and... You know, he just never give up. Like it's that it's that old fairy tale, is it, that we love to to hear in sport that he wasn't going to quit. And I seen the photos in in sports file afterwards. You know, when he finally got his hands on the trophy and he collapsed like he was on all fours. You know, when the whistle went and he just he just couldn't believe it. Like it, it was a real shame that it wasn't on TG Car instead of the Donegal game. I mean, because I, I I would love to have seen it. You know, everyone had bought into the narrative of the whole story and everything else. It was it's just hugely entertaining and um. I'm looking forward to seeing them in Leinster now. Yeah, me, yeah, me too. So we want to talk about Glenn, not their Glenn, Glenn. But before we go, before we get to Glenn, there was a small matter of an intermediate championship in Derry, Nile, which Steelstown won. 
our very own Conan Doherty, uh, well, not our very own, I can't say that anymore. <laughs> he, hasn't been, he hasn't been on the show in over a year. He was doing co-commentary with BBC and uh, we saw the video. So he got overcome with emotion and I couldn't understand a word he was saying. It was just as well. He took off all his headgear, his mic, his earphones, and he went running down to jump around with his teammates. Just doesn't get any better than that. He's an old romantic, uh, um, Conan. I was going to say our Conan. <laughs> Yeah, uh, you weren't the only one who couldn't understand a, a word he was saying <laughs> because I was struggling trying to trying to figure it out as well. But uh, no, I played I played five aside with Conan before, and I've never seen him run as fast as he did <laughs> when he was running into the middle of the pitch there. But it seemed to be it seemed to be a very kind of an uh, emotional occasion. I think they've kind of knocked on the door in Derry um, a few times and have kind of just narrowly missed out. But um, it was it was obviously great for them to to break through yesterday and it's I know the first ever win, first ever win, isn't yeah. it? And the captain gave a mention that the, the club is named after um, Brian Og McKeever, a lad who was a brilliant footballer and passed away a few years ago. So it was kind of very emotional to sort of dedicate the win to him and. You could see by Conan what it meant to everyone up there. Yeah, everything means something to Conan. If another <laughs> if another intermediate team had a fairy tale story, he could start crying. Never mind if 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 Steelstown win it. So congratulations, Steel Ta- Steelstown. Congratulations to Conan. The big one, obviously, Lee was um, Glenn. Jesus, like I mean, we're talking about Unions beating Nave Connell handily enough. This was a very surprisingly one sided game, considering Slocknail's pedigree, winning five of the last seven. Yeah, it was an incredibly comfortable game from a Glen point of view in the end. Um, and that, and that, that is obviously hugely surprising. Uh, Maliki O'Rourke is the uh, Glen manager and he just had them sussed out to a tee, to be honest. Uh, Glen did, they played something, you know, of a blanket defence with everyone, or sorry, Slack Neil played something of a blanket defence with sort of everyone behind the ball. And um, That's Glenn unlike them his, though, isn't it? Yeah, well, they, off the ball they do, they get everyone back and then they try to they break in numbers, to be fair. But this one, it did just look a bit strange because... So Glenn had Kieran McFall in centre half back and he always came bursting off the shoulder just like what we were talking about and he was constantly breaking the line yeah. and they couldn't contain him in the first half. He scored three points from play and then when you're constantly breaking that line as well and coming at pace, quite often you get fouled and so they got a, a handful of free kicks and Danny Tallon was very clinical on the frees. Uh, Slacknil had only scored one point in the first half and that came from Brendan Rogers, who was their fullback. Um, they got a little bit desperate for a score just before half time, and they ended up leaking a goal, which was converted by Danny Talon. And Glenn would never have admitted it then, and the fans would never have admitted it because it means so much to them. They're so edgy and everything's on the line. But I couldn't really see any way back. You know, Slackney just were not in that game. Like, Shea McGuigan had scored something like 332 that championship season, um, and he didn't score at all that first half, and only one point in yeah. the second half. You know, to keep him nullified is is that alone is, is is an achievement. And the second half, then Connor Glass just came to the front. He was sensational. Uh, scored a free kick off the ground past the fifty. It was unbelievable. And he was breaking the line, coming through with two more scores. Um, it was it was really just all Glenn. It was it was disappointing um, from a slack nail point of view. And seeing Shane McGuigan come all the way into his own half to get just to get his hands on the ball, you know, with that old desperate thing, just I just want to get on it now. I mean, Malachi O'Rourke and the likes must have been delighted to just see him get the ball there, so far away from their goal. Well, that's it. Like, I mean, it's hard. We're talking about Nave Connell with a very unimpressive, you know, three in a row attempt. Slock Nail had three shots in an entire half and only scored one of them. That was Brendan Rogers. Um, you know, who plays in, in defence. Just a horrific first half from a slot nail perspective. But I love that Kieran McFall at centre-back and he scored three from play and he's bursting up, breaking the line, doing everything at pace. And that's what it, that's what football is about, is doing things at pace, not passing back to a fella just standing there in a standing position. There's no coach ever thinks this is a good way to play football. You always support a man at speed and you're breaking some sort of line. Um, you've Connor Glass, Emma Bradley in midfield. What a midfield that is, um, like I mean, Lee. Jeez, they're very strong. Way. And I suppose Connor Glass, Emma Bradley punching holes. It's all about punching holes. And look, we can live... Gaelic football is a decent game to watch, even with bodies drop back. Once you're punching holes and you're trying to get through there and, you know, with a bit of urgency. And obviously, like I say, if it doesn't work out, you're just completely clued on that it's not like 10 years ago when a team turns you over that they're got off running down the field while the, the attacking team is kind of standing there, you know, scratching their behind. That's kind of the lazy kind of way it was when pe- teams didn't understand it. Just work to get it back and take it back off them. And I suppose that's the criticism we had from... Uh, from the Dunny from the Donegal one. But Glenn look a very good Glenn look a very, very good team. There's Talkdale dominate they could dominate now. 
Yeah, they really could. Um, that that's how comfortable that they looked, and they're only going to go on. They've got a really great manager. Um, all these young players, like we, I talked about this before, they'd won something like four minor titles in a row. Yeah, and everyone was saying that when this team finally get to the front, they're going to um make some noise in the Derry Senior uh, Championship because this is their first ever. So they finally got over the line. Connor Carvel, the captain, and someone I don't know why. I don't know if he's not interested in playing for Derry or if he's not looked at, but he, he's another brilliant player. He got a, a great score in the first half as well from cornerback, just bursting through, breaking that line. Um, he said after the match, you know, like he was asked, what's it like to finally get that monkey off your back? And he said, really, sometimes it felt like an elephant on the back. But, right. you know, elephants, monkeys to say, it's, it's cows that should be worried because there won't be one milked in Glen for the next couple of days. <laughs> just some great scenes of them coming back in. Uh, excellent segue into that uh, there, Lee. You're getting very, very good at this. <laughs> just some great scenes of them coming back into the town or the village, whatever it is, on the back of a lorry and all. And again, it's like the nice things. Like, I mean, geez, sometimes you un- underestimate a county title when they'd never won it. Um, before now like I mean you have um, Enda Gormley obviously such a brilliant player for Derry saying it's the best day of his life he's two weeks off now like they had a good team in the 1990s and they couldn't win it Fergal McCusker was interviewed as well this was on Derry uh, TV he says we're finally in the winners club all the tags have been chokers losers whatever we can walk into any bar in Ireland and hold our heads high like, I mean, think about that. Like, this is an All-Ireland winner and he's saying that he could walk into a bar, any bar in Ireland and hold his heads high. You know, obviously, he means when county titles are being discussed. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. This is obviously something weighing very heavily on these lads, you know? Like, I don't know. I've never really thought of it that kind of much. Then again, like, I, I won, I won, without brag, I won six early and I, I never didn't have one, if you know what I mean. So you don't really appreciate, you know, the, the kind of, like you say, the, the elephant on the back that they had. Yeah, exactly. Like it must have been, like it must have been such a huge thing. Like for Enda Gormley to say that, like a man who's won all Ireland's yeah. Ulster titles, won everything there is to win with Derry, like, and for him to say that this is the best day of his life, and he wasn't even playing. Like it kind of, I'd say the whole community, like they were kind of, they were in the shadows maybe of of Slot Neil and Slot Neil kind of winning everything and Glenn just being sort of the the poor relation bridesmaids. But, yeah. Um, it was it was great to see that that interview with the two boys was just brilliant because apparently they've been like two kind of huge men in coaching and they've dedicated their lives nearly to getting the Glen going in Glen in uh, in underage football and they've got some brilliant young players on that team now and as you said they could be definitely a team to to go on and dominate and uh, the lads it was great to see that interview because it sort uh, it just it, it just summed up that kind of how much it can mean to a club who has never won before. Yeah, no, it definitely has. Before we move off, Glenn, why are they called the Watty Grahams, Lee? Oh God, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you just threw that. I just threw I thought it. I was really well researched here for the, <laughs> all the Glenn match and Slack New match, but why they're actually called that? That's that's a, a great question. Okay, and, uh, we'll find that out. I'm sure, for, someone will tweet me it. <laughs> we'll find that out for for Thursday's show. On to leash hurling, uh, Niall Clock Balakala. So they won two in a row, right? They won the first one, or they won the first one this year. They won both county championships this year. I'm I'm getting tongue tied here. The first one they won in August. That was the 2020 final, and now they've <coughs> won the the 2021 one in November. Picky Mara captained them to both. They beat Clock or they beat Boris Clacotton, um in both. They looked it looked over for them. They were six nil down, um, seven points down at half time. Um, and stage a brilliant comeback in in the second half. Like I mean, Willie Dunphy scored five from play. There's a few standard. Picky scored fourteen points. All their kind of big players stood up and were counted, and won an absolute classic game in Leash. Yeah, it must be an absolute sickener for Boris Kilcotton like to lose two county finals in in what three or four months. Yeah, like, you know, and they'd lost the county final before that as well. Like so, that's three in a row. And Jesus, when you've when you were leading six points to no score, when you're up by seven points at half time you're thinking like this is our day and it's all going so well for you but it was nearly similar to the O'Loughlin Gales thing they'd kind of started so well that when the pressure started coming against them at the finish they just didn't have another kind of a gallop in them like and the clock by Balakala lads just watching the highlights they kind of really turned it on in the second half like Willie Dunphy he got some great scores and like anytime you've seen him he's just such an accurate kind of anytime he gets a chance it's nearly straight over the bar like and he was very good and Willie Highland picky Maher but Lee Clear scored some brilliant points as well like yeah. he scored two absolutely wonderful points down the left wing like when they really needed them and 
Jeez, it was a sweet one for them. Like t- twice in the space of three months, it's it's some going, some yeah. celebrations. It's very very sweet. Lee Clearer plays cornerback for for Leach Hurlers. Um, he was marking Aaron Dunphy. Aaron Dunphy scored three. Lee Clear scored two from wing back and wing forward. He'd take that. He only outscored by one. Um, by Aaron Duffy. Picky Marr was interviewed after the game. Obviously, the captain Lee. I'll throw it to this because you're our sports psychology expert on this show. So I'll throw this one through. Uh, now this is like you know you're meant to keep things positive you're, you, and all that kind of positivity is very important from a sports psychology point of view so here's Picky Mar the captain I never thought we'd do back to back very negative straight away Picky the sports psychologist wouldn't like that statement I t- <laughs> he says I never thought we'd do back to back I thought we wouldn't win that game in general <laughs> he says <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how we won it to be honest with you <laughs> so I'm, I'm sure he was keeping these negative thoughts to himself as captain and saying cheers lads I don't know if we have a chance <laughs> <laughs> of neither winning back to back or winning today. I'm sure it wasn't part of his speech, but I really appreciated his honesty because, like, I mean, negative thoughts pop into every player's head. Like, I mean, it's sometimes it's hard to push them out. I've, I've thought in the middle of games, you know, when you're meant to be a leader and I'm trying to fight the thoughts of, oh, geez, that's gone now. You know, and you're trying to fight that off and you end up coming back. And the easy thing to say in an interview is to say, geez, you know, I always believed. I don't think fellas are being completely honest. See, I'm, I'd be more of a glass half empty, pessimistic type of fellow where I like to think the worst and then if the best happens, you're delighted, but you're preparing yourself. Do you know that kind of way? I don't know. Like, Listen, give me some advice here. I need some help here, Lee. <laughs> I can't believe this is my role on the show now. Like, I, have, I have like no qualifications or anything to be the sports psychologist, but um, maybe it's just psychological warfare for next year. He's he's so far ahead of the game that he's already playing the team down. <laughs> Um, going into next year, and that's 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 his psyche. It's 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 elitism there, like our proper elite uh, mentality. Um, I think all I he need, know, all he, all he needed to do was wrap his two wrists and say, "Win, picky, that's win." It. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Or maybe maybe he does it the other way. He gets spurred on, and, and you look at his wrist, and it just says, "You're crap. You're never going to do it." <laughs> and then that actually spurs him on. It's just a, an opposite, using negative connotations and turning them into a positive by. Uh, Proving yourself wrong. I think we're getting to the bottom of the sports psychology of Clock Balacala <coughs> here because uh, Picky was also quoted as saying, and so was Willie Dunphy, because the game was getting very close at the end, Nile. It was almost a draw. Boris Kilcotton obviously got it back um, to a point after Boris. Or, uh, Clock Balacala went two ahead after going level, and then Boris Kilcotton got back to a point, and it looked like it was going to be a draw. And Picky said, the last thing we wanted was a draw. We've Willie Dunphy stag next weekend. So there, I think we're getting into the psyche a little bit. Let's do it for Willie stag. Jeez, that was some interview from, P- from Picky. Yeah, Manor, wasn't full of it? good like, quotes, yeah. I'd say, I'd say if he was interviewed uh, in the week leading up to the game, he'd hardly have said, I, I don't think we're going to win this game. But, um, geez, no, it's, it's brilliant to hear such... Uh, such honesty and I'd say he's probably like he's probably telling the truth when he says that that they, they wanted to get it done for Willie Stagg because do you know when they've been playing like they've been playing a, a long time now when the county final the led year, on yeah. to another and on to another again three months later like it's they probably haven't had much time you know to, to go out and have the crack so I'd say the whole thing they were like buzzing like we'll, we'll win this or we'll lose this but we'll go out anyway and if it was a draw and it was to have crashed over into Willie Dunphy's stag weekend, that would have been some disaster, yeah. wouldn't it? Well, think of the week they're going to have. They're going to have the celebrations of the county final, then Willie's uh, stag next weekend. So listen, what, a, what yeah, I'd be a little bit jealous of the week those boys are going to have. The Wolf Tones won it for the first time since 2006 in Mead. Um, this was against the odds um, as well. Dunboyne were favourites for this one. But never, we're kind of in control. It's a day for the underdog, wasn't it? Like, I mean, they were in control for the game. They got an early goal. Um quite like their their manager Michael McDermott is from Kildare or from Clare I'd never heard I'd never heard of him if I'm being honest like maybe I shouldn't say that but Kilmurray Kilbricken he managed them to a county title uh, they beat Port Leash actually in an all Ireland semi-final back in 2008 they lost the final to St Gauls um, he won a county title with Mona Lean in Limerick um, he won a county title with Ramor United in Cavan and now he's after winning a county title with Wolf Tones against the odds um, in Mead. Like, I mean, he said here, because again, I'm coming back to kind of Donegal um, kind of match. And here's Michael McDermott. He says, we're difficult to break down. Um, 
he said because they only conceded 10 points but it's because of the, it's because we work so hard and we ensure our game plan is about discipline defending and putting pressure on the man with the ball when they're kicking I suppose that's just another way of defending um, Lee where you like to put pressure around the field and make sure good ball isn't kicked in and then trust your defender to be able if the ball is a little bit sloppy coming in your defender has a great chance of getting it especially in kind of tough conditions in winter football I always remember in winter football it's very difficult you know to play good kick in football because the ball's so slippy, defenders are so tight, and sometimes you'd actually probably win more balls back if you allowed that kick pass in than you know you do if you're dropping loads of bodies back. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, and and fair, fair play to Michael. Like, I mean, that that's some CV to have to go to all them different counties and and come back with senior titles or senior or senior championship wins, and um, for all of them. So that's that's very impressive. In terms of the type of football, like it, that is, I mean, that is all about discipline and, and it's all about trusting and trusting the players. Like we talk a little about, like Nice, obviously, you know, the players they all just trust themselves. They didn't have the manager and player power is such a huge thing and uh, nowadays. And just knowing that when they go out there, that they they can you can execute the plan and you shouldn't be ranting and raving from the sideline trying to change things in the middle of the game. It should all be done beforehand. And I think that's sort of what he's talking about when he means the likes of discipline and knowing that they're going to get back and they're going to put the hard work in and that creating that mentality around that we are hard to break down and getting confidence from that. Yeah, Keen Ward and Shane Glynn were, were co-captains and they shared the speech at the end. I don't think I've ever seen that before. Usually one co-captain defers the speech um, to somebody else. So enjoyable um, that, they sh- that they shared the speech. One other thing, and this is from the match report, is I just love this. This is pure Keen Ward. And this is why Keen Ward, this is why I like love watching Keen Ward playing. Keen, Keen Ward, like... To fist pass a point would just be, you know, I don't. Keen Ward wouldn't be able to sleep with himself for weeks after. He wouldn't do it anyways. But anyways, he he gave out to me recently. I was playing a junior B match and I admitted to fist pass the, passing a point and it came off the crossbar and he actually gave out to me um, about it. Playing junior B at forty three, he just doesn't like it. But here it is off the off the. Um, he hates fist fist pass the points even more more than me. But here's the war, here's from the match report. Keen Ward signalled his intent to do serious damage by going for a goal with an early free in, dragging his effort just wide. Like he just go for goal, even just from a free. I'd say Keen Ward. I haven't seen this. I'm hoping to see it tonight. Like he could have got a free. Someone else get a free. Keen had run up, you know, while the the other team is kind of walking backwards towards the goals, and he might just try to flash it into the. He just wants to go for goal, and I kind of lo- I just I I love that. Well, he always had that kind of a he did. daring element he did. to his game. Like he'd be picking off kind of these sort of spectacular passes, and do you know he was always a brilliant sort of kicker of the ball as well. And um, I suppose when you have that confidence in your game, and you're a bit of a maybe a bit of a chancer as well, like you know he was always going to he'd take a chance like that, and it is great to see because it would it would nearly have the the other boys sort of thinking right. Well, these boys, do you know, Keen Ward is. He's going for goals straight away. We could be in a bit of bother here, like. But um, apparently, he had a brilliant game. Like he was spraying passes all over the field, and I think he's thirty six now, like. But he's still like he he looks fit, and he's you y- you never lose it, like when you when you have that sort of skill, don't you? Know, that's like? the thing. Like I mean, Keen Ward, like he wouldn't mind me saying that. Like I mean, he was never going to win races out to the ball. He's not that type of player. He wasn't that fast. He just he's brilliant, brilliant football brain. Um, and he is a brilliant passer and he's brilliantly accurate. Like, I mean, the man could play, <laughs> he can play for as long as he wants, really, as far as I, as far as I could see. Like, I mean, I'm sure this will spur him on. Um, in Monaghan, Scottstown won. Um, the Beat True is the name of, the, of the, the club they beat. They were managed by Pascal Canavan and they beat Bally Bay in the final. They had no county players, Lee. Very unusual for a, for a club to get to a county final and not have any county players. Um, and t- geez, they, 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 were, they were really, really good in the game. They were 5-1 up at the first water break. They only lost by six points, but the last kick of the game was a goal for Scottstown. So they kept Scottstown, who were unbackable favourites for this, honest, right up until the last uh, kick of the game. So they deserve an awful lot of credit. Yeah, no, uh, fair play to them. It's, it's an excellent thing, and it, it's just real... I'm sure they can buy into that and talk about that. Hey? It's just such a club mentality. Uh, then Gannon Clarks did something similar last year for Tyrone. They um they didn't have any county players in their panel at all in the 2020 season. Paul Donahue got uh, called up the panel the following year when Brian Deer and Fergal Logan took over. So like it must be just that sort of psyche of you know we love club football and we we go for it uh, and it's just all for the club and wearing it on your heart and your sleeve in that sort of sense and really having pride in it. So. 
it's, it's that would have been a huge achievement if they got over the line. But Scottsdale are a really tough team to beat. Um, was it Kieran Hughes got man of the match? You know, he kicked three points from play. He was excellent, and Connor McCarthy and all as well. Like, I mean, there's some big names who who have played county, and uh, they were the difference on the day. Yeah, Kieran Hughes was man of the match in the semi final as well. So, like, I mean, it's nice to see him in a little bit of form because he's gone off the the boil completely. Um, with Monaghan the last few years because of injuries and things like that but he's still a really really big player um, it would be good to see him back um, next year in Longford Mullen Octa won easily and Gowna drew so the parish nearly had you know double celebrations now as it turns out Keen Mackey with Mullen Octa completely forgotten about that last Thursday we didn't give that a mention he transferred to them um, from Castle Rahan uh, one of my fa- one of my favorite day. Well, it wasn't my favorite uh, moment on the show at the time. Was when Castle Rahan won the county final in in Cavan two I think two years ago. And I text Keen Mackey after the after the game. Keen, you know how's it going? Congratulations. You, you, any any chance of taking a call for the show tomorrow at one o'clock? No bother, Woolly. He back to me really quickly. I was delighted. That's done now. No bother, Woolly. Uh, talk to you tomorrow, Grant. Just give us a shout then. Uh, rang him the next day at one o'clock, no answer. Rang about three times, text him, no answer. He replied to me three days later. <laughs> so I always have time for Keen Mackey after that. Now he's winning county titles with Mullen Octa. That's their first one in three years since they won the three in a row. So congratulations. A weird one in that little parish, Niall, because the Mullen Octa lads will be going mad having to crack. The Gowna lads are after drawing. And you were alluding to this. The draw is probably the worst result. I don't mean it's worse than losing. It's not um, the Boris Kilcotton clock, Balakala. But you're all geared up. You look at Enda Gormley. He's, he's taken two weeks off work. You know, like there's one week ruined if that is a draw. Like players usually take the Monday and Tuesday off. That's ruined. They're taken. Now I've lost two days. You're livid. You kind of mentally, in a way, just want this kind of thing, you know, finalised on the day. And now Ramor are back training while Mulnock are running around the parish uh, celebrating. So it's not an ideal uh, situation. No, like it's uh, you're you're straight back into it. And I'd say they were planning. I read there that they were planning on having a you know a big kind of a get together because both teams Mulnock and Gauna they use the same kind of a hotel, hotel for yeah. their functions. Like and I'd say the place would have been hopping last night and everyone would have been looking forward to it. Like but. And then it just, it kind of gown at for it to be dragging on now. It's kind of, it's not what you'd like, but you're lucky. It'd be worse, in fairness. It'd be worse. We're talking about uh, Picky Maris Stag. Would it be worse if you lost the game, in fairness? But, I would think um, with the clock bell of colours, with Picky, and with, uh, I'd say they take losing over a draw. Yeah, but at least, <laughs> I'm the, only joking. At least the clock bell of colours lads have a county title only three three months ago, do you know? So they could fall back on that. Yeah, but yeah. For gown in fairness. But that's an unbelievable story, isn't it? That there's only 800 people. Um, 400 in Molyneux to 400 in Gauna. So and I think Gauna has 700. Yeah, because right. I was talking to Mickey Graham about that. Yeah, 400 and 700, but it's t- still tiny. And to have two clubs like right beside each other in half, one half a parish, the other half a parish, both of them in the county finals, like it's, uh, there must be something in the water over there in, in Loch Gauna because it's, uh, it's unbelievable stuff from the two of them. And, yeah, now Gowan have to go again. The the, the Mulny Octobies will have to be steering clear of them over the next few weeks. Yeah, exactly. Aero going in clear. Can't get every, every county uh, final in because there's just too many of them. They have five dual players. Shawnee Buckley, um, ex-Limerick uh, player, is coaching them. Uh, five dual players and they beat, it's funny, the McCarthy's played with Ina, what's the name of it? Ina Kilnamona. Ina Kilnamona. And their football club is Kilmurray Kilbricken. So the McCarthy's won in the hurling against Airog and now Airog have after getting their own back on their football team. It's kind of two two amalgamated teams the McCarthy's play for. Yeah, and it was five dual players, as you said, on the Airog team. So it'll be nice for them to kind of get their get their back after losing that um after losing that hurling semi final. Like and there was a few more lads on the panel as well. No, that, Shane O'Donnell dual and did disappointed with that. I thought he could have been a bit of a, a baller. Yeah, you'd think by him, wouldn't you? Like the, he has the speed and uh, yeah. you think he'd be a good footballer, but um I suppose he, he must be a must be a busy man. But uh yeah, disappointing for the McCarthy's but they have a hurling final to look forward to now, so they're they're not too bad. Yeah, they won't be too bad. Have to give a shout out to Stephen O'Neill here, Lee. Uh he won a Masters All Ireland. Um I'm a played Masters last year myself. It's a fantastic competition. Really, really liked it. A funny thing, um, 
which we always give the lad stick on our master's WhatsApp group is we failed to, we forgot to enter it this, <laughs> this year. <laughs> so we would love yeah, to have been in, we would love to have been in it. That's what happens when you're masters, you forget things. <laughs> you're getting old. So we forgot to enter the competition, which is absolutely <laughs> dreadful. Uh, but Tyrone beat Dublin in the final and uh, Stephen O'Neill ran amok, especially towards the end. Dublin got a goal to go ahead and then Stephen O'Neill kind of took over. He's the only player in the history of Gaelic Games to have a minor All-Ireland an under-21 All-Ireland, he has two under-21s, a senior All-Ireland, he has two seniors, if you don't count 2008, which he says he doesn't want the medal for because he only came back for the final, which uh, that's kind of like the Roy Keane mentality. If I don't, you know, contribute on the field, I don't want it. You know, a lot of subs around the country, life lifelong subs won't be happy with that uh, attitude at all. And now he has a Masters All-Ireland. And listen, he could have two or three more Masters All-Ireland. Very disappointed he doesn't have a club All-Ireland. But look, we won't... Uh, we won't uh, won't complain too much about that but that's fantastic that's never been done before Lee and another lovely little story is Cormac McAnallan's brother um, Donal he played in it um, midfield and he has the Masters so in the the McAnallan family he's completed the set of minor under 21 senior and Masters All-Ireland so that was a nice little story too yeah, it was a, a really nice way to, to sort of round it all up. Um, he Obviously, Cormac McAnallan, who'd passed away in 2004, he'd already won minor 21 and senior, of course, the, the first ever senior title with uh, Tyrone in 2003. So for his brother, Donal, who was a, a handy footballer as well, I think he played for Tyrone uh, up until about the minor stage, but he just obviously wasn't quite as good as Cormac. Um, so for him to get the boots on and play midfield, and he was... Uh, integral part of the team himself and then to say straight afterwards in the post-match interview with Jerome Quinn that uh, you know that it's, it's nice that he can be he can complete the set for the McAnallen family and, and bring this medal home and um, just at the time of the interview too you know he was holding his uh, son who he called Cormac Jr and it was all just very fitting and, and very, very nice. lovely. Yeah absolutely lovely so fantastic congratulations to Jerome again I have to stress that Masters tournament is absolutely fantastic uh, tournament the great thing about it uh, Stephen O'Neill I think said after the game the legs are gone but you're all of our legs are gone everyone's at the same age so like I always say they could be playing any level of senior junior B whatever it is and you could be marking a 20 year old and you don't have the legs for him and he's it's not enjoyable in the Masters there is nobody going to be that much younger than you, you know, unless you're really pushing it at 50 and we don't, you don't really want to pick 50 year olds because they're gone that little bit too old. You want 40, 41, 42 year olds um, and fit lads as well. So yeah, fantastic competition. Uh, that's it lads. Uh, we don't have time for semi-finals in Dublin. Pat Spillane's son playing for, for St. Jude's. Didn't realise he had a son that was a uh, senior club footballer. We have Cork semi-finals decided. We have Tipperary football semi-finals decided. We have Mayo football uh, decided. A whole load. We have Wicklow County champions. We can't fit it all in. I, I, there's people from Bell Mullet uh, given out to me that I haven't given Bell Mullet any shout out on this show. Ryan O'Donoghue is single-handedly dragging him to a county title. Uh, beat those fancy boys from Westport, the boys from Bell Mullet, and they only up from intermediate 2018. I promise... We'll do something on Bell Mullet. Uh, we might even get the mullet from Bell Mullet on the show to, to talk to us about that. So we'll do all that either Thursday or the following Thursday ahead of that game. So we'll be back, uh, we'll be back this Thursday anyways and we'll talk to you all then. Good luck. <laughs>